You have joined us today for UI design for smarter geospatial applications. You may have started working with DBYD NextGen, or perhaps you're in the process of starting a new design project. So today, we're taking you behind the scenes of our latest application, DBYD NextGen. And in the next half hour, you'll learn about the design process and here's some best practice techniques that you can apply to your work. And joining us today to discuss this topic is Harry Contos, Senior UI Designer here at Esri Australia. Harry has over 20 years experience in digital production design, stretching across TV, web, mobile platforms, and SaaS. And Harry has worked across a range of industries, including architecture, media and advertising, scientific research, weather and climate, IT services, messaging systems, and of course, geospatial. A qualified design anthropologist, Harry can support research into user needs and profiles, understand group behaviours and apply cultural insights to design work, whether visual, interactive design or physical. So I couldn't think of anyone better than to take us through today than Harry. And I welcome you and I'm going to hand across to you now, Harry. Thanks, Laura. I hope everyone can hear me correctly. That's Thanks perfect. for that nice, yeah. Thanks for that nice introduction, Laura. It's really good. So yeah, welcome everybody to this webinar and uh, it should be fun. Today, we're going to dive into how the user interface for DBYD NextGen came about and some of the methods that we used. So I'm going to explain what Sentinel is in a moment. And then I'm going to describe our practical user-centered methods. Um, uh, and uh, I'll touch on perceptual bias as well, because I think that's important. And I'll describe the UI in more detail with some samples at the end. Just a little bit of housekeeping though, first. What you may know as DBYD NextGen also had an internal name, Sentinel. And I use these terms interchangeably throughout the presentation. Um, today though, we're gonna cover the processes that we used in defining the UX and the interface design for the refer a referral service or Sentinel. So what actually is DBYD NextGen? Well, it's the software around a vital national service to assist in preventing damage and disruption to Australia's vast infrastructure networks. Simply, it consists of registered users submitting requests for underground asset data maps in areas they plan to excavate. Sentinel is about preventing this kind of costly and disruptive damage. Let's take a bit of a close look at what's going on here. I think a bit more came out of the ground than dirt. Yeah. So firstly then, the principles, the design principles that underpin the Sentinel web application, which we you know, determined early on and uh, with the intention of adhering to eight principles and on the user-centred side, you know, we want to feel that Sentinel is enabling, that it enables me, enables me to do the things I need to do. It benefits me. It also benefits society, given what a critical piece of software it is for the infrastructure. So beneficial, delightful. We want it to be delightful. We want people to use it and feel good about using it. On the atmosphere side, we want sentinel to sound articulate understandable concise we want it to look modern innovative look thorough clean and functional feel powerful and feel like a consistent experience and we've put a lot of work into trying to stick to these principles and we believe we've done a good job so you know at the beginning a lot of work goes into um escaping out of this fuzziness and this ambiguity you see here. And to do that, we need to use appropriate design research methods. Sentinel's got such a broad scale of user base that we really needed to employ 
quite a few different design research methods and, and of course they sort of blur across disciplines anyway. So we work with like six to eight individuals for single user testing using this thing called Axure, making prototypes in controlled settings and later with uh, hot jar videos of that kind of usage, analysing what they do, looking at where they move, where the heat map forms. We tested with small groups as well, and that's in that centre column area. We tested with small groups using direct observations, interviews and surveys, and we analysed usage patterns of masses of people gathering quantitative data using surveys again and analysing user flows, looking deeply into the help desk feedback we're getting and also user metrics. The help desk feedback was invaluable. Uh, some of the user-centred uh, methods uh, that we like, we did like physical whiteboard brainstorms, always fun, lo-fi sketches, digital design workshops in a tool called Miro, card sorting exercises, wireframing mock-ups, rapid prototyping and depth interviews, guided observation sessions, hot jar videos. And all of these methods were threaded throughout the project in a very pragmatic and you know, fast prototype driven process. That's what we like. Here's an example here to test behavior and the look and feel of a feature you know, what it does, how it should work. A clickable micro prototypes like this are created in just a few minutes and describe an interaction without having to use words. So that's the beauty of these little clickable things. You don't even have to talk about it. You can see straight up what it's supposed to do. And when we observe the journeys that users take through a feature, we actually analysed hundreds of hours of hot jar videos um, of production prototypes because it really helps to understand people's desire lines, you know, where they want to go, what they want to click on, where they're going, and it actually then facilitate those desire lines to make it what they want it to be. And, and, and that's really fun, that part. Uh, let's look now at the iterative process on specific screen, the create inquiry screen. And here's a very early hi-fi example or a concept on a known scenario. It's really good to start with more extreme or provocative visual concepts because invariably things do become more and more conservative as the project progresses. A lot of reasons for that. Feedback from DBYD here was really quite positive on the structure especially. Other feedback was to get closer to the brand and add in-app guidance we actually inverted the old flow of filling in forms before drawing shapes and presented the tactile location setting features first. The principles here being benefit, innovative and modern. Still iterating on a creative, on a creative inquiry screen, here, a clickable prototype was accessed by select real users and annotated live during Miro workshops, hands-on workshops. These participatory design sessions led to so many feature requests and ideas to prioritise and created all kinds of maps of uh, what we should be doing and focusing on after these sessions, which is really cool. This valuable bit of user feedback directly informed a later iteration in the form of a presets feature, which if you're not seeing it yet, you'll see it very soon. You know, I was saying, you know, that uh, the user needs to be able to set up their profile with default values, which you can do now. Otherwise, it's just cumbersome and, you know, it takes too long to lodge an inquiry to do the same thing over and over. So we fix that with presets. And in surveying, uh, the surveys, they help consolidate thinking around some core features. And yes, even drawing circles on maps, believe it or not. So we continually revise and enhance the usability of the Lodge inquiry flow in the interface, chunking it, adding progress indicators, keeping it clean and evolving it better. The principle here is to be perfectly understandable. 
In this case, users were having trouble with the circle tool. They were trying to drag it off the palette and onto the surface of the map instead of clicking on it and drawing on the map with it. I think we've addressed that now. I won't read these all out because um, there's quite a few, but really just an indication of the typical actionable insights that we gathered from these kinds of user tests. In one workshop, we isolated 13 little enhancements that were implemented before the next workshop two days later. The principles here being consistency and power. And here's where the design system that we use really helped speed this up to able to do it so quickly. Uh, some of our co-design participants like Esri Australia, Map Data Services, the state and national DBYD folks, top inquirer groups, selected individual super users, and later help desk and client care portal information, web analytics, the ideas portals from SmarterWorks and in-app feedback and support all feed in in different ways at different times and converge to help us um, with the design process and we work with them to um, because they provide valuable insights and sometimes specific feature requests. And this informed how we arrived at the structure, the layout, the navigation and the chunking of information that we have now. Okay, now some fun things. User testing, prototyping and iterative co-design are really great tools, there's no question. But now I want to look briefly at perceptual biases which can influence design just as much. So did you know then that 25% um, of the human brain is dedicated to visual processing? Everything that I'm showing you today about Sentinel UI is a visual artifact, every bit of it, including the typography and the negative space. We're constantly trying to make sense of the world as we see it. And yet we each differently and still make visual processing mistakes on the simplest things. Take context here. So we're expecting to see a letter in the context of other letters. We expect to see numbers in the context of other numbers. We automatically neglect ambiguity and suppress doubt. It's automatic. Our perceptions defined by what cognitive psychologists call a perceptual set, which is a tendency to perceive or notice some sensory data and ignore others couple of reasons for that. So expectation though is just one factor influencing perceptual set, um, the process involving selection, inference and interpretation. Other factors are emotion, motivation and culture and, and they're just as strong but really I'm just focusing here on expectation. Some more fun stuff, we've got this characteristic I like to call visually informed bias which is actually unconscious as well. So within 200 milliseconds, we processed race and gender of an unfamiliar face. And I saw this experiment being conducted. But this is to do with partnering and threat. Um, it actually gets worse. Within 50 milliseconds, we decide if the screen design has made a good first impression. Seems like an impossible task, right? But it actually can be achieved with good holistic design. So if principles are followed, good design will work in any time frame. It doesn't matter if it's 50 milliseconds or 50 seconds. We form new mental pathways every time we process what we see. So when we stare at something like this, if we've not seen it before, finally it clicks, right? And when it clicks, it can't be unseen. I don't mean like an auditory click, I mean it just clicks, right? If you don't know what the image on the right is, look closely for a little while if you get time. When you get it, it will have just rewired your brain. Now it gets even worse. We have easily distorted memories, which are biased for vivid and extreme ends. And we've got really terrible short-term memory that lasts just 15 to 30 seconds. It's really bad. On the cognition side, um, 
here's one of many trade-offs to consider when designing the flexibility versus usability trade-off as flexibility increases usability decreases we have to find the right balance but at the right time and place and for each kind of user and when you've got a lot of users and a lot of screens and a lot of complexity you start to see that it's no easy matter but what we want to do it's doable. What we want to do, though, is achieve this scenario on the right here, forcing users to constrain flexibility with hacks, especially this kind of hack. Um, it works, but yeah, we should be doing it before they get to that spot. And now some, uh, some foundations for Sentinel. Colour, uh, one of the most important, and it can't be overestimated how important colour is. A lot of people don't get this, but it is, especially in hybrid UIs that mix geospatial visualisations with regular visual elements. In Sentinel, colour is tightly managed using named tokens in the carbon design system for static and interactive core objects. And we extend it with an external complementary palette. Overall, the look is unified, flexible, and can be easily themed without touching specific colour instances. And what that means is we can switch a theme and the named colours stay named but change their attributes. For the Typography Foundation, Sentinel uses Plex Sans and Plex Bono. It's a modern superfamily published by IBM. Plex is open source. It has variable font metrics and is digital UI centric for non-fatiguing accessible use and by that I mean that each letter form has high contrast and is very clear and accessible to, to read. Um, productive means it's for use in web-based product design where the user needs to focus on tasks and in expressive mode it's for editorial and digital marketing experiences, allowing for a more dramatic or graphical use of type. The difference being mostly in font metrics. Sentinel's designed on a uniform grid using fixed base mini unit of eight pixels for all elements, including spacing. The header is a consistent global nav item whose context vary by user role. And from left to right, we go um, from local to more global. There's a detailed spacing spec in the design system which unifies the look, negative space, aspect ratio, horizontal and vertical spacing everywhere are ultra consistent. And I can't stress enough how easy that makes the life of a designer to have a full on spatial system for the UI in place. You don't have to think about, it's wonderful. The framework layout has five screen sizes to help control the information density for different screens. Um, and now to components, really, like they're the heart or the building blocks of the design system. They enable very fast UI design and development and save hours and hours of repetitive work. There are more than 50 reusable made components that we've used. Components enable visual and functional consistency there are hundreds of variants and thousands of attributes for most use cases, and they're somewhat customizable. Could be more customizable, but you can do it. Sentinel uses and reuses dozens of design system components for visual and functional consistency, and without them, I can tell you we'd be a bit lost. So recall we looked at expectation in perceptual set theory earlier. Well, the expectation of UI elements to look and work in the same way aids users in learning the system and recalling how to use it. The principles here are understandable and consistent. The carbon design system components are available in UI kits for Sketch, Figma and Axure, the design tools, as well as Storybook and GitHub for the development team. Zeppelin, central design to development handoff tool features direct linking of components from sketch to storybook so everything remains synchronized it's quite wonderful to see it in action actually that bit um, 
For some parts of Sentinel, we also use Principal for animations, Figma, Adobe XD as well for an, um, sort of automatic animations, Slack, Miro, Hotjar and Jira at various stages in the design process. Here are some actual examples of, of parts of the UI as implemented in Sentinel. Here, for example, in setting up the accessible design of matte hex bins, you know, like the hues, opacities, labels and size on light and dark map surfaces with many hexagons and few hexagons. There's quite a lot to have to, to think about. And did the same for shapes of all sizes, points. A standard Inquirer user dashboard view uses clickable tiles, interactive graphs, helplets, and more in a fully responsive mobile friendly design. This is an example of a highly customised UI supporting the ArcGIS central map, both functionally and aesthetically. The principles here are modern, functional and delightful. And that's achieved in part by functional animations and subtle transitions. This example shows the transformations in two of the five view sizes for an equivalent full experience across devices with responsive design equivalent being the key word here. So at the more utilitarian end of the application design, this one shows um, an extra large width with automatically expanded full admin user nav, tabs, accordions and a universal notification design. So it's got a bit of everything in a, in a utilitarian screen. Keen observers might notice at the bottom left there that developer tools were enabled by this savvy user. API keys, webhooks and GIS integrations, for example. Example UI details here are showing empty states, feedback tooltips, danger colours and inline micro interactions. The principles here being thoroughness and conciseness and I like to call it extreme thoroughness and extreme conciseness, I love it. These phone sized examples illustrate the layout adjustments made to handle an equivalent experience for small devices. Again, that word equivalent. There's tablet views as well. So we've got five breakpoints, if you recall. So in numbers, Sentinel, since its launch in the middle of the year, has got now over 134,800 users, 880,000 plus inquiries have gone through and 5.1 million referrals. Quite, quite staggering stats in my mind. It's peaked at and continues to do these things, 16 inquiries per minute and super impressive from registration to first inquiry submission Someone called Jack O did it in 54 seconds. Amazing. Um, also, uh, there are 48,000 monthly active users and 95, uh, 90, sorry, 985 members, asset owners. Um, now the success we've seen with Sentinel and our experience with the process and design system was so positive that we decided to apply it to another member of SmarterWorks suite, SmarterWorks Locate. Uh, you can try that using this URL you see on the screen. Finally, for those looking to use some of these UX and UI ideas in your own GIS projects, it might to help to remember things like putting the user front and centre, which is user-centred design. Using position, size and other visual variables to signify importance, especially on maps. Moving elements to get attention, especially on the periphery, right? This is about visual processing or the Savannah preference, you can look that up. Leverage the significance of colour, but don't rely on it for everything. Don't take before you give. As much as possible, avoid heavy or onerous signups before revealing the functionality in the app. Give people just enough info. Think like a minimalist. Don't punish users for being human. 
So enable generous error tolerance in your UI, make it flexible. For every action, an instant reaction. Let them know what's going on. Thank you, thank you. I really hope you liked what you saw. It's been a glimpse of what's involved in mixing production UI with GIS maps and data. A little of how it's done and how you can make use of some of these ideas in your own projects. Now it's back to Laura and I believe she may have some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. That was fantastic, very interesting um, and so great to have a little bit of insight into what goes on before we start, I guess, using the applications themselves. Now, we do have some questions that have come in, but there's still time to ask a question and you can do that through um, the questions uh, box on the GoToWebinar panel. Um, but just before we get started, I wanted to just mention that there, you might, if you're considering like where to next, I've popped a couple of links up on screen and if I can multitask, I'm going to chuck those through in the chat as well. Um, so there's an interesting paper that provides a perspective on user-centred design for public facing organisations. Um, but also if you're keen to discuss best approach best approach to design for your next project, um, then you can reach out to our team. So we have a team dedicated um, around design at Esri Australia. And also I did pop in the chat already. Um, if you're keen to experience uh, SmarterWorks Locate, there's a link there um, that you can access. Now, uh, back to you, Harry, and a couple of questions that have come in. Okay. So, first one, um, so what special things um, did you have to do to the UI to make it work with GIS maps? Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Laura. I guess the most important consideration is about layout, you know, like real estate, uh, how to make the space, you know, for a meaningful, usable, interactive map, not just any map, but one that works, and make it coexist with the necessary tools around it, around it and on top of it. So in Sentinel, we we're quite lucky actually in that the map data is not too complex and we did not need really to rely on extensive legends or other widgets too much. So we've got about, I don't know, maybe 10 different kinds of maps in Sentinel and each one's incorporated on its page in a holistic and and uh, and probably like a symbiotic way within the UI that it coexists. So we look at maps. Um, we, we look at maps as as a part of a bigger picture. We don't look at um, an interface as being a map based interface or a non map interface. If there is a map, great. If the map works, even better. If the map is critically important, then it gets support from the UI around it. If the UI is, uh, yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. That, that's basically how it goes, yeah. It does, thank you, Harry. And actually, a follow-up question from me was, you know, were there any custom map properties that you needed to make, to make um, the UI work better or make the map work better with your design? Hmm. Yeah, again, we were super lucky because, you know, being Esri Australia and having access, at the access that we do, um, we can really do what we need to to make it work. So base maps got a lot of treatment. Base map pickers got a lot of treatment. Base maps with uh, different visualizations and boundaries and all kinds of cool things on them from different locations and different LGAs get special treatment. Pop-ups, again, we had carte blanche really with the pop-ups. Symbology, styling, typography, all these had to be customized to the look and feel set out for Sentinel by the carbon design system, as well as our own way of doing things, right? So I, I was given pretty much uh, free reign to make a UI, not make a GIS system as such. It just so happens that GIS is central to it. Map extents, auto zooms, active draw feedback, um, lot boundaries, all of these are added to maps to aid orientation. 
hex bin shapes needed a lot of work. Um, the careful relationship between symbol colors and opacities on widely differing like map surface colors and whether there were none or just a few or hundreds of shapes shown at a time. There was such a lot of what seems com complex and you know this is the sort of tool that you really need to ca cater end to end right. So yes we did make many customizations but they were all perfectly doable and you know as I say quite a bit of fun to do and in fact in some cases fed back into some of the community work being done around the maps for for um, ArcGIS as well. Thanks, Harry. Now, we have actually come to the end, but I've got one more question um, that's come through um, asking, what was the most fun aspect of designing Sentinel or DBOID Next Gen? Uh, uh, yes, fun, my favourite topic. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so working from carte blanche is always fun, right? So empty screens, white, white space, empty canvases. It sounds scary, but and it is, but it's fun. Our team was really fantastic and the support of the clients and, you know, the, the great people at DYD, so easy to work with, was, was great to have. There are a lot of passionate users out there and they, they loved being in this co-design process that we set up. And that really came across, right? They just couldn't wait to be involved. They got into it, they're full of passion. That was, that was fun. That made it all sort of seem like quite, quite a valid and cool thing to do. Uh, from the design side though, the freedom to test some of the theories around, you know, around visual theory, around cognitive psychology and see it in action improving things, that was cool. And I like being able to measure that stuff. Sometimes it's intangible, but it ends up being quite, quite the opposite, it has a huge effect. All in all, though, the smoothness, the, the pure design aspects and my team made it a great aspect and the freedom, you know, to explore these things. So I loved it. I wish I was still back in it. <laughs> thank you, Harry. And we have gone over time, but thank you so much um, for the session today. And thanks, everyone, for your questions. Um, there have been a couple that I haven't got to, but I'll make sure that we collate those and we'll put out um, an FAQ post that will be available to everyone um, so you can have a look at that. Uh, but for now, Harry, thank you again. Uh, it was a really interesting session. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, everyone. That was fun. <laughs>